My name is Chris Staples and I'm the Executive Director for Academic Personnel. So just a few quick logistics before we get started. Please be sure to mute yourself. Um, we'd appreciate that. The chat itself will be open and we will do our best to keep up and address your questions as we move through the session. With that being said, please note that we may come back to some of these questions as we move through the training because we'll have some of these key pieces uh, touched on. Uh, in addition to that, if you'd like to ask a question, please feel free to raise your ha hand and we can address that uh, in a, a live Q&A, no problem there. Um, and today's session will be recorded and can be viewed at the Faculty and Leadership Development page, of which I'll show you that as we move through the training too, so you know how to access that. With the logistics out of the way, what I would like to do is introduce Provost Marianne Reed, who's going to kick off today's session. So, Marianne, if you would like to start, go ahead. Absolutely. And Chris, I'm going to ask a question because we didn't discuss this before. Can you explain exactly what this training is about? So this specific training is going to be for tenure track faculty who are either going up this year and or maybe going up in the future. So, you know, I think a lot of these pieces will just be tied around um, what's important to note or keep in mind as a tenure track faculty member. Uh, maybe speaking a little bit about the narrative for the organization of one's file and just ensuring that we're meeting those deadlines when they come forth. Um, absolutely. And the deadline for submitting um, names for the external reviewers, is that coming up or is it coming going? That is pretty much moving through the process right now. And come October 1 is when any external reviews should be out. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you so much. And, and uh, I'm just going to take a few minutes uh, because I know that both Chris and Melissa have a lot of very good information to share with you. I, I do want to say, uh, first of all, good afternoon. And uh, those of you who are going up for promotion and tenure this year, um, congratulations, you've made it this far. <laughs> and now you're in the, the final stretch. I used to be a, a, a long distance runner and we're now in that final mile. So, um, what I would say to you is, is that your first priority is going to be to send out your file for external review. Um, so you'll be working on that piece of your file um, and then really kind of finalizing your file for the end of the year that will be um, you know, submitted for your promotion tenure review. So um, uh, Chris mentioned uh, the narrative. And I think what I, what I wanna say to you is that first of all, you know, the file, the materials in your file should speak for themselves, but the narrative is very important. Um, your, your summary of your um, experiences for the past five and a half years, um, because it's important that you tie all those things together in a way that makes sense. Um, so, so really it's providing the context for the material that's in your file and for giving the various levels of reviewers um, a good idea of, of who you are, what your trajectory is, what you have focused on, um, and you know, how you have tied all these things together, and, and also for you to be able to demonstrate that you will be continue to be productive um, after your tenure process, um, because that's really important. We Productive, engaged, part of the institution. You know, this is, as far as we're concerned, this is the first stage in your long journey with us at WVU. Um, we try to make this process, I think, as efficient as possible, as professional as possible. And we know that it is stressful for you as you're going through this. Um, you know, we wish it weren't so, but you know, you do know that there's a lot um, on the line here. So, um, you'd probably be uh, a little crazy if you weren't anxious at this point. But if you've done everything that you needed to do, if you have you know, fulfilled the obligations of your position, if you have been getting annual reviews that tell you you're on track, um, you should be in good shape as you head into this, to this uh, final stage of your process for, for promotion and tenure. Um, know that the university takes this process very seriously. Uh, we think that other than hiring, uh, this is the most important thing that we do as an institution because we are making an investment in, in you for the long haul. 
Um, and so we want to do it right. We want to make sure that we're following all, all of our own uh, processes uh, the way that we said that we would and that others who are evaluating you are doing the same. And I want to assure you that at every level of review, you are getting a separate review that looks at your contributions um, in, in light of the expectations, university and college expectations for promotion and tenure. Um, I think that's all I have to say. I just wish you all the best of luck. Uh, know that, again, you've got a, a very strong system behind you, and, um, and we're always here to answer questions for you. Um, should you have any questions about the process and what you need to do moving forward. Chris, is there anything else that I can address? If I would say if there's any questions for Provost Reed that do not tie in, we'll say, you know, specifically to what we're going to cover with the training, just from a general perspective, please ask. If not, you know, we'll, we'll let Provost Reed go and we'll move through the training. Any questions? All right, pay attention and good luck. Thank you. All right, so as we move forward, um, there's a couple of players that I would like to just introduce here today. And first one would be uh, Associate Provost for Faculty Development Culture, and that's Melissa Latimer, and she'll be assisting me as we move through the session. Anything that you want to share, Melissa, are you good? I'm good, it's just good to see them all. Fantastic, so second one, and I know maybe many of you had the opportunity to participate in uh, Brian Meredith's digital measures trainings that took place a couple of weeks ago and are also recorded and on the faculty development and culture or leadership page. Um, Brian Meredith is gonna join us just in case we have any questions that come up tied around digital measures. So Brian, anything you'd like to share, sir? Uh, not right now. I'll just uh, keep an eye on the chat and I'll, uh, I'll see what I, if, if any questions come up, I'll be able to have the, uh, try and answer. Thank you, sir. So taking a look at today, um, there's some key pieces that I would like to work through and share with you uh, during this training. So it's going to be location of key documents. What are the standards for promotion and tenure? Um, talking a little bit more about that narrative and evidence in digital measures, because it is very important. Research, teaching, service, and that evidence of that quality that you would be putting in digital measures. External evaluations, because I know we do get a lot of questions about the external evaluations and what that looks like. And then I'd also just like to touch on, um, as we continue to move through this pandemic, what does it look like from a COVID-19 uh, promotion and or tenure guidelines, as well as then that extension of the tenure clock. So these will be some of the topics that I covered today, and then hopefully that'll help you from a question perspective, just to kind of go, okay, have we gotten there yet or not? And we can come back to those. So any questions then before we start with the training itself and, and specific documents? I'll take that as a no. So first and foremost, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about this location of key documents. So I'm going to share my screen here. And your key uh, spot to check out will be faculty.wvu.edu. And this is going to be the landing page. And for any of you, if you scroll down, and being that we just heard from Provost Marianne Reed, you want to scroll down to her picture. And right underneath her picture is the policies and procedures. And here we have academic Freedom, professional responsibility, promotion, and tenure. It's going to be a key spot for you to access. And the reason is, is because it's going to highlight for you um, the faculty calendar for annual review, which is going to include those key dates, kind of tied to what Provost Reed was speaking to with respect to external evaluations, as well as when each of the processes should take place, whether they be at the department level, uh, the college level, as well as at our uh, provost office level. So what I would note here is, as it works through each of these um, different uh, layers, and each layer has a de novo review, come May 12th, if you're going up for promotion and or tenure, 
um, is the date of which you will then be notified of the provost decision. And that's at the end of the nine month contract year. So just so everybody knows, that's when you'll get communication on whether or not you achieve that promotion and tenure. In addition to that is our faculty evaluation, promotion and tenure guidelines. Now, these are key documents for all of you to reference as you move through this process. Now, we have the West Virginia University PT guidelines or the, the procedures, the parent document, and then each individual college and possibly department will have their own guidelines. They are all going to be in play for your promotion and tenure um, application. And here's the dates that they would have been approved. All right. What I would like to note is that um, as you move from the university to the college to the department PT guidelines, they are going to be more detailed, they're going to be more specific, and they may be more rigorous. So it is important to not only see what the procedures document says, but also what it says at those levels as you move down. Um, I've already commented on when the dates are uh, approved by the provost office. So what this means is if you were going up for promotion in tech land or tenure, these would be the guidelines we would use to assess your file. All right. The last piece I just wanted to touch on this page is tied around the COVID-19 revised annual evaluation guidelines. Now I'll talk about this at the end, but I did want to reference this as well as on our main page, we have additional COVID-19 uh, adjustments that have taken place. And I would reference these two because we know that the pandemic is going to have uh, long-term effects when it comes to what does it look like from a research, teaching, and or service perspective when you put your files together. So any questions here were with the location of the key documents that you want to reference? Are we good, Melissa? Okay. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. And the next topic that I wanted to jump into is what are the standards or how do I know what the standards are for promotion and or tenure? So again, these are going to be key documents for you, but most of these are going to be located within your digital measures file. And these would have been likely uploaded by a DM administrator within your college and or department. So the first one to build off of this is your offer letter. And if you haven't reviewed your offer letter since you originally signed it, please take the time to go back and read that offer letter because it may contain or should contain your key areas of significant and or reasonable contribution, but it may also state specific outputs or results that you need to achieve in research, teaching, and or service. So the offer letter really is that foundation of that building block that you want to reference as you move forward. In addition to the offer letter, and please note that this does not hold true across the entire university, but some colleges and or departments will develop what's called a memorandum of understanding. And this could be a follow up to your offer letter of which then they are even more specific with what you must achieve with research, teaching and or service. This may have also occurred somewhere along your probationary track or tenure track timeline where it changed a little bit of what the results or output that your department or college may be looking for. So again, please reference any MOUs that may exist within your file that you've signed so that you know you're going after the right results or output. All right, so building off of this is annually you would have a workload plan. And your workload plan is going to outline, again, that effort that goes into research, teaching, and or service. It may include specific courses taught, committees that you need to serve on, as well as research publications or grant execution. So those workload plans build off of, again, that offer letter and MOU if applicable. Any questions so far? All right, I'm going to keep moving through this then. Annual reviews. So annual reviews take place every year within your college and or department. Again, depending on how many layers are within the framework that you are in. Now, the annual reviews are also very important. And the reason they are very important is because 
you get both a rating tied around the results that you have produced over the course of the year, as well as then statements about how you are progressing towards promotion or tenure. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about the ratings. Now, ratings should be tied to your actual results, not tied to effort. So when we think about meritorious ratings per the West Virginia University Procedures document that I had referenced earlier, good and excellent are considered meritorious ratings and would equate to um, a positive promotion and or tenure file. Satisfactory or unsatisfactory ratings are considered non-meritorious. Now, what I do wanna note here is that satisfactory rating means you're meeting the expectations and it is appropriate for continuation if you have already achieved associate professor with tenure. But with that being said, a satisfactory rating is not gonna to lead, towards, lead towards a successful promotion and tenure file. Now there's a nuance here and something that's important is it's okay to have satisfactory as long as you're moving in an upward trajectory as you move towards that critical year. In addition to that, within the parent document, the procedures document, it does state that a preponderance of meritorious ratings during your tenure track or probationary track status um, is needed to then obviously be promoted and or tenured. So please keep that in mind because those ratings are important as you move through the process. But even more important is paying close attention to the statements that outline what you should be doing to achieve promotion and or tenure. And these statements are telling you, are you making the correct progress or do you need to take a step back and think about, okay, actually I'm not going down the right direction. And they've noted that I have to, we'll say, apply for a specific grant, or we encourage you to seek the assistance of teaching and learning commons to assist with your instruction within the classroom. Any of those statements you wanna pay very close attention to and make sure that you're taking action on, because again, those are gonna set you up for success when you get to that promotion and tenure critical year review. I'm gonna pause there, Melissa, because I saw the chat was. Just a couple of people asking about MOUs, um, not because not everybody uses them, so they're not familiar with the term. Um, and so that's, that's all I'm seeing so far. I, I need a second to sort of scroll and make sure I don't see any hands up. And I do not see any right now. Okay. Memorandum of understandings, I will say, generally speaking, where we see them most often is within the Statler College of uh, Engineering and Mineral Resources. Now, that's not to say they don't exist elsewhere, but that's where we see it most often. So again, this MOU would have been something you would have signed and would have been uploaded to digital measures as um, either a permanent document or a supporting document. You do have another question. Should we report annual ratings in our statement narrative, address, discuss them in some way? It's really two different questions depending on what the rating is, right? Yes, and so from a narrative perspective, when we talk about that, it is, it is totally fair for you to take a step back and say, all right, so here was, whether it be a rating or encouragement or feedback that they gave me, and here's how I addressed it. I think that is appropriate for a narrative um, and would, once again, help tell your story. Chris, what if, what if though, um, you think you were uh, good and, they, and you got a satisfactory? Um, what should you do about that? Because I, I see that as, like, sometimes there's an immediate address and then there's the longer term address for the next report. Uh, fair question, Melissa. Um, I'm going to have to balance this one, and I hope not to cause confusion here. So there's, there's two different avenues that can take place. So if we are specifically talking about the annual review, you as the faculty member have the opportunity at any point in time to file what's called a response. And that response then would be based off of how Melissa had presented the good versus satisfactory. You could file a response of which then that would also be uploaded to your digital measures file. And then the chairperson and or potentially the dean may respond to that response, which would also go into your file. Now that's separate 
from if we're talking about what we're working through right now, when we're talking about the promotion and or tenure file. And in that instance, if you are um, concerned about statements made within your promotion and or tenure letters or recommendations, that's where you would file a rebuttal. And the rebuttal has a specific timeline attached to it, which is five days after you receive that review or recommendation, you can file a rebuttal. That rebuttal would be put into digital measures. And then when the next level of review takes place, that level of review would take that rebuttal into account. And again, getting back to where you, you had us to start with before I asked this question, because I wasn't clear what, what the person was actually asking, is that when someone when you get feedback in your next annual review, you should talk about what they told you to do, what you've done, and then what you found by doing that, right? And that's just part of that back and forth, showing that you're responding to the feedback, you're making adjustments, and you're thinking about whether or not it's improving uh, whatever it is you're focusing on, research, teaching, or service. Absolutely. And you know, please keep in mind that as, as these reviews, annual reviews take place, that the intentions of whether it be that department committee or that chairperson or division director is giving you feedback to help set you up for success. Because we want everybody to succeed as they move through this process. And so for you to address it, address it and make those steps forward is, is wonderful. And that's what we're looking for in those files. All right. So that kind of brings us to probably a good point when we think about the annual reviews. If you're with, if you're in that tenure track line, you're going to have what's called a mid-tenure review. And this mid-tenure review is going to be more rigorous than that annual review. And the mid-tenure review normally occurs two years prior to your critical year. All right. So I have to balance that because we've got to keep in mind that critical years do adjust and change. So we try to share that if it's two years prior, that's the appropriate time for a mid-tenure review. And this is going to take into account all of your annual reviews, your productivity up until that point in time, and really give you some very specific and detailed feedback about where you're at as you approach your critical year and what you still need to accomplish to get there. And then lastly, what I do want to point out, and that's important within this process, is we talked about the preponderance of meritorious ratings. But the other piece that's in the um, parent document is that to achieve significant contributions, if it's in research, teaching, or service, depending on again, where your areas of significant contributions are, is that you need to meet and or exceed those who were recently promoted before you. And that time period when we say recently promoted is normally within a two year period. So I do wanna note that and call that out. Um, I will be unable within this session to be able to detail for each of you individually what that looks like within your specific department or college but that's where I would ask you to touch base with your chairperson, um, division director, and in some cases, dean, to really get a good idea of what that means within your specific um, organization. So any questions on those pieces that are the standards for promotion and or tenure? Still good? Okay. All right, so your story, and I know one of the questions came up, do you address this, address um, whether it be ratings or feedback that you achieve within the narrative? And that, that is completely fair to do so. But this narrative, as Provost Marianne Reed pointed out, is very important in the process as you move towards promotion and tenure. And specifically with that promotion and tenure application, we wanna hear your story as it pertains to your teaching, your research, and your service. Now we often get, how long should this be? Um, we're gonna say normally, you know, two to five pages. We don't wanna go over the top, two pages is probably more appropriate um, as you move forward, but we understand that we wanna give you that opportunity to share your story and tell it because that will then um, help us from a standpoint of putting your promotion and tenure file into you know, consideration and taking a step back to see what you've achieved, what you have uh, received for feedback and how you've grown 
as well as what you really want to highlight that you brought to the table. So that narrative is really important in the promotion and tenure process. Chris, there's a question. Uh, the, are the two to five pages for the external reviewers or for your department, your chair, your college for, that, for internal? Is it internal, external, or is it both? The narrative that you're writing. Um, I'm, I'm, I apologize. I was speaking to the narrative specific to internal for, okay. for our purposes. Um, I would have to defer to the college and or department on how they've approached external reviews and, and their expectations tied around how long that should be. Yeah, but there should definitely be a narrative there. Just the length of it is, is probably discipline and college specific and you should rely on that. I, th I think that person was just trying to clarify, is it, do I just do this for my internal audience? Do I do it just for my external audience or is it both? And you're, okay. said, and you're saying both, which is, yeah. Um, I see there's a question, is it necessary for non-tenure as well? Absolutely, tell Absolutely. your story. Yep. Actually, yeah, very important. Okay. So evidence and digital measures. Now I know Brian um, had gone over a lot of the execution piece when we think about digital measures, um, where items need to be uploaded, what does it look like from promotion and tenure? Um, you know, over the last six years of working with uh, Melissa, a common phrase that I share with her is less is more, all right? But in this instance, that's where I throw that out the window and I encourage you to follow the more is better um, because being responsible for that evidence in the file and your goal in this uploading of evidence to digital measures is to detail not only how you did your job, but how well you did your job. And in doing so, this is where more is better to ensure that your file is complete and we have all the information in there to review. Because please keep in mind that if it's not in digital measures, we are unable to review it as part of the file. So that's why it's very important. In addition to that, if we think about the PNT document, if we do not have evidence in the file, at that point in time, there's nothing to review and that would be a non-meritorious rating of unsatisfactory. So please upload that evidence into digital measures, more is better. Yes, Melissa. Uh, is the narrative optional or required? Have heard varying answers to this in the School of Medicine. I mean, why would you not do a narrative regardless of whether or not it's optional when you can control the, the story about what is in your file and what you've done and why it's significant. No one knows your story better than you because you've lived it and you've just written about it. I would I'd always do it no matter what, babe. just always do it. I do not disagree, Melissa. Um, if, gonna, if we're I'm looking it again, always do it. Totally fair. All right. Okay. Did I miss any other questions? Or are we good? Um, when we think about that supporting documentation, um, whether it be your effectiveness as a teacher, researcher, or your contributions within service, you know, again, more is better. So if we're talking about teaching, at a minimum, we know that student evaluations and syllabi for each course must be included. When we think about research um, or that creative scholar, scholarly activity, whether it be the publications or grants, or exhibits, links to those should be uploaded so that we can take a look at what those contributions are. And then from a service perspective, again, depending on if it's an area of significant contribu contribution or reasonable contribution, upload that evidence that states that you did it as well as how well you did it. So again, evidence in digital measures is very important and helps us review the, the file in, in, in its entirety. So Brian, did you wanna add anything else from a digital measures perspective at this point in time or any insights that you may have based off of evidence in the file and the importance? Um, not necessarily. The only thing I would have uh, a note here is if you are um, importing your publications, 
um, and you're using one of the third party import tools. Uh, I know if we have some folks on here from the School of Medicine, we've got a great integration with PubMed. Um, they can click import in the publication screen to import their, uh, their publications. I just want to note here that that doesn't actually import the actual document itself, which is what you're talking about, documenting the file. All that does is it imports the citation. So after you go through and you use the import tool, um, you need to go back to each entry that came in and document the file with a copy of the of the actual thing that you're you're porting to report in your file. Um, and the same goes with the uh, the automatic uh, pull in of information from KC. All we do is is we pull in the blank information from K, or I should say the the citation more or less, the OSP number, the title of the grant, where it went, when it started, when it stopped. We don't pull in the green sheets or the blue sheets or anything that, that goes along with documenting the award. Um, so when you're looking at your file, specifically when it comes to those kind of imported sections, make sure that you're opening up each entry and that you're documenting, you're supporting what you're reporting. So that way, when it gets to your level, the provost level, um, they have something there to substantiate the claim that, that you've done something. Thank you, Brian. Okay, when we think about research, service, teaching in the various forms across the university, your individual colleges and departments are going to outline what those specific standards look like. So again, I strongly encourage you, please speak with your chairperson and or dean to determine those specific outcomes or results. If we think about that research and creative activity, we know that it can take many forms, including whether it be refereed publications, high quality, securing large exter external grants, intellectual and uh, intellectual property and patents, as well as performances and exhibitions. In all of these cases, that quality of that research is very, very important. From a teaching perspective, we know that you're expected to include uh, in your files evidence of significant curricular or programmatic development, important contributions to the university's teaching mission. And this evidence normally includes uh, assessment of the instructional processes, outcomes, application of findings to enhancing courses and program effectiveness, evidence of ongoing contribution to solving problems or addressing unit defined needs, priorities, initiatives. When we think about service, it's that benefit of the organization, whether it be to your department, college, university, and state. So I want to emphasize and reiterate that the quality here is important because that will kind of tie into our external evaluations and what that looks like for external reviews. There's a question about including internal grants as part of your package. Yes. I would include internal grants as part of your package. And that kind of ties into the more is better. So we can see and highlight what you've been doing from a uh, internal grant perspective. Okay, for the annual reviews, is it okay to link preprints from arxiv.org, which are going through peer reviews but have not been published yet? So it's, it's okay to include them. Now, where I think the balance here is whether or not you get credit for them. Right. Um, so uh, I would say within digital measures, and I know um, if, you, if you have the opportunity to watch Brian's recorded sessions, he talks about how you can provide this evidence and then update that as it moves through the process. Yeah. And I think that's kind of how you would want to approach something like this. And this one does not say that they've been accepted, right? It says that they are going through the peer review, but they haven't been published yet. Um, and so it's not clear to me if they're accepted, right? And so that would need to be documented. And I believe, Brian, in that little drop down menu box, you can change the status of where it is. If it's been submitted, if it's under review, if it's being revised, that kind of stuff. Is that correct? That's correct. You can change the status and there's always a there's date fields for each status at the very end of the record. So if you change the status to um, uh, accepted, then scroll down and change the date, you know, add the date uh, as, as whatever the date of acceptance is so that that gets brings it into your report. Um, and again, you know, the, the question is whether or not credit is, is applied is a different question. But if you put the status and put the date, it'll at least be brought into the report. If a pub has been accepted via confirmation from the editor, 
but it won't be published by the time you go out for tenure. Can the pub be counted? So what I'm hearing is that it's, it's forthcoming and will be published. Yep. All right, so if this is a case of um, assistant professor going to associate professor and the award of tenure, the answer is yes. If this is a case of an associate professor with tenure going up to going up for promotion to professor, the answer would be no. It must be in print for associate to professor. Correct. Okay. Oh, that was a thanks. All right. So all right. I'll keep an eye on it. All right. The next topic I wanted to hop into here is external evaluations. And I know this one um, generates some conversation. So we'll proceed forward and see how many questions pop up here. External evaluations are part of determining the quality of your research, teaching, and or service. So the external evaluations must be completed when your area of significant contribution is research or service, or in the cases where you're a teaching associate professor seeking teaching professor. Now, for, for our purposes here today, this training is geared towards tenure track or tenured faculty members rather than that non-tenure track. So I'm gonna to try to keep my focus there. The process of selecting external evaluators is gonna include you, um, your chairperson and or chair of the committee, as well as the dean. And the goal at the end of this is to try to have at least four external evaluations that are part of your file when we review it. So to get to four, the normal process is the faculty member comes up with six names, and then that chair or the chair of the committee comes up with six, na six names, and it moves through a process to determine um, who's gonna be approved to reach out to for this ex external evaluation. Now, what I would like to note is that the list of the external reviewers' names, not the final list, but the overall list can be shared with you, the faculty member. And as the faculty member, you have that opportunity to comment on whether it be um, you research A and this external reviewer takes the complete opposite side with B and therefore maybe not the right mix. Although with that being said, ultimately you as the faculty member do not choose who those external evaluators are. That is gonna be determined um, whether it be at the dean level and or depending on the, the procedures or processes within your college, whoever's going to do that on their end. So with that then, again, six names from the faculty members, six names from that chair, you come up and your goal is to get at least four external evaluators. Now those individuals that may have been closely associated with you, they may be asked to provide an evaluation of you although we ask that that relationship is then disclosed. So off the table, obviously, is any um, personal relationships from a standpoint of uh, a family member, right, or otherwise. It could be the case where you're reaching out or have um, an external evaluator that you've had a relationship with. Again, we just ask that it be disclosed, and then whoever determines which external evaluators are going to be chosen and reached out to they make that decision on their end. So I'm gonna pause there just for a second and see if there's anything I need to answer. Because I was just typing it in the chat, it was a quick question about, it's the same process when you go for discretionary, we use the same process for external reviewers. Correct. And sometimes, you know, depending on how long the time is between your first promotion and your second promotion, it might make sense that your list has some of the same people, right? Or if you've gone in a different direction, it might make sense that it's a list of people that has nothing to do with the first list, right? Absolutely, Melissa. And when we think about that promotion to full professor, um, keep in mind that we're also looking for those external reviewers to you know, comment on that national or international reputation that you have, because that, that is part of the process in achieving that full exactly. professor. Grade. Exactly. Um, so with this, on the page that I had showed you earlier with the guidelines, as well as um, other, the, the faculty calendar for annual review, there's also um, the list of peer or aspirational peer universities that 
we would like for you to use when uh, listing or searching for external evaluators. Now we understand that it may be the case where that world expert is not housed within a R1 institution, whether it be peer or aspirational. That is okay to have an external reviewer that is not at that R1 peer or aspirational peer university. With that being said though, we would ask that you um, explain why that individual is chosen. So whether it be, we'll say an R2 school, it may even be the case where the person is outside academia. Um, but that's where we wanna make sure that there's a clear description on why that person would be on your evaluation list. So the, the other pieces I just wanna to touch on here is that the external evaluators are not going to determine the quantity, all right? That's, that's driven by us or driven by your department or college to determine what the quantity is as it pertains to promotion and or tenure. But what we are going to ask them to do is comment on the quality. And those external reviewers will also be asked whether or not they think you should be promoted and tenured at WVU, as well as if you would be promoted and tenured at their institution. This is just one piece of that application and of that puzzle as you move towards uh, promotion and tenure. It is not the sole um, evaluation metric that we use when we go down this road. So I, I wanna note that, make sure that you all hear it because I think there's times where, and I understand that it's stressful, um, when you're going out for external evaluation. With that being said, it's just one piece of that puzzle. Any questions on external evaluations and or evaluators? Okay. All right, so overall, um, you know, I encourage all of you, let's not leave anything up to chance here. So you know, your opportunity throughout this process is to tell your story, again, how you did it, as well as how well you did it, meeting those expectations that were set forth, whether it be in the offer letter or expectations set forth in the annual reviews. Share your story, right? Upload your documentation as evidence into digital measures so that for when, when one goes to review the file, it's very easy to review it and give you credit for what you've accomplished. Um, the last piece I wanted to touch on here today was uh, just tied around the COVID pandemic. So, you know, Melissa and I, as well as other members of the provost office and what we've been communicating, whether it be to deans and or chairpersons is, we understand the pandemic is gonna have long-term impacts, um, especially when you think about when a faculty member may have joined WVU, where they're at on their tenure clock, and, and what that looks like. So, you know, a couple of key points I want to share with all of you, as well as for any administrators that may be on the call, is that um, take a step back when you're reviewing the research, teaching, and service, and how it may have been impacted by the pandemic. Um, you know, for example, if we think about conferences, uh, a number of conferences were moved from an in-person to whether it be a virtual or even potentially, you know, uh, canceled. So. What does that look like from a credit perspective and giving that same credit because it was something that was scheduled, maybe they did join virtually rather than in person, but there was reasons for that. That should be the same credit when we think about uh, opportunities like those. So again, I just wanna call that out and keep in mind that on your end as the faculty member, that's where you wanna share and communicate these aspects within your narrative. Um, there's a question that I'm I'm not I'm not sure, so I'm going to read it. I'm new to the faculty as a visiting professor. Where can I get examples of appropriate research? I I think she's asking appropriate research for what she's supposed to do within her unit. Um, Trina, do you want to give us more information in the chat or either unmute and ask the question so we can be clear what you're asking? So what, what I'll do, Melissa, I'll just kind of jump in. Oh, I'm in business. 
I'm not sure what research I should be doing. If, um, so it, it may or may not be in their offer letter, right? Might not be a requirement for the visiting professor. Yeah, so that's something I would definitely double check. Um, with a visiting prefix, there are times where research may be tied to your appointment within that offer letter, or it just may be referenced in encouraging you to continue a research portfolio. So in that instance, that's where I would definitely partner with your chair and take a step back with your chair to determine what does that research look like? What would be appropriate outlets that I should be um, looking into? And I think that will help set you up for success. Uh, someone that has responded that it's best to talk to your chair concerning appropriate scholarly activities from your job. You can also talk to members of, the, of your faculty evaluation committee, people who've been successful in the unit. I mean, um, you can talk to a variety. You should be getting the same story though, regardless of who you talk to, right? They should be pointing you in the same direction. Uh, I noticed another comment just tied around, a, a, I'll say a specific COVID statement as it pertains to one's research. Um, again, that's where I would include that COVID statement um, in your narrative or describe in your narrative how your research may have been impacted due to the pandemic. I think that is completely appropriate within that narrative. Yeah, Chris, that one wasn't for the general. So you might want to check again and make sure you're not getting some that aren't going to everyone because I, I can't see those that are going to you. Okay. So then I'll make a statement. I may have missed some. Um, so I apologize for that. And I'll have to come back to those later on. Um, so ask, the it, piece, ask it again to the general and we'll get it, okay? Yeah. Um, the other piece within this pandemic and again, I wanna share with each of you is the modifications of duties for certain full-time faculty members, extension of the tenure clock. So this piece of it is Board of Governors Faculty Rule 4.5. The reason we bring it up is because um, previously we did do an automatic extension of the tenure clock, but we also still have the opportunity for an additional um, extension of the tenure clock due to whether it be personal or professional circumstances, which when we think about the pandemic would likely apply. Um, and, and we can discuss offline if you have individual circumstances that you would like to talk through. But I do want to bring that up that it is available to you. Keep in mind that you can only extend your ten tenure clock three times or a total of uh, three years. So you can't go past nine years on a tenure clock uh, probationary track assignment, but it is something that's available to you and may be appropriate as we move through the pandemic. Um, so please note that uh, this is on the website. Again, that, that main landing page that I had showed you, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer those when it pertains to the extension of the tenure clock. So Chris, just wanna uh, remind them that yeah, we will be, uh, everybody that registered will get the link sent to them. I don't know if I got that in time to Andrew before he logged off. Uh, but there's a question in terms of should the COVID adjustment apply to uh, the discretionary uh, promotion to full professor? Should you talk about COVID um, in terms of how it's impacted your research, teaching, and service um, as part of your package from associate to full? I would say yes. I, yes. I mean, I, I just, I'd leave it at that. Yes, yep. because again, I, that's I agree. telling your story and your narrative. Right. Um, and I think it's important because we are, we are all going through this um, and we're all going through this together. So if you start thinking about those, whether it be external evaluators or other <laughs> colleges and universities, they're going through the same process. I think it's important to highlight that. Hey, Chris, there's a question about um, how late How late can you apply for an extension to the tenure clock? What's the time frame for applying for an extension? So I think there's applying in general, and there might be the question specifically about COVID, because you were just talking about COVID. So I'm not sure which one they're asking. So could you do both? Um, I will try to. I think okay. so. First, you cannot apply for an extension of your tenure clock if you are in your critical year. Correct. So. That's, I think that's kind of where you got to take a step back, see where you're at in the process. But if you're in your critical year, 
you are unable to extend your clock. If it's prior to your critical year, then you have that opportunity to do so. Um, with that being said, it would depend upon if we're talking about personal or professional circumstances and what those circumstances are. So this is kind of, this is a tough one to answer in in for the general um, session that we have here today because there are going to be individual circumstances that occur. Um, so I think you know the easiest to tie it back to the pandemic would be let's say as a faculty member um, and and we would not want this to happen, but you had to care for whether it be we'll say uh, a dependent because there were significant um, COVID issues. That would be a personal circumstance that would then qualify for an extension of the tenure clock. I think that's the best example I can give within this framework. Anything to add, Melissa? Yeah, so let's just say somebody came to WVU last fall and uh, they were not able to set their lab up completely and get it running because of all the restrictions. So in a sense, the lab wasn't, they weren't able to get it set up to get everything growing or whatever they needed to, to. So, so that would be a professional and that would be beyond their control as well. That one needs to be applied for within a year of the, of the incident, correct? Within, is it within a year? Yeah, if that's happened to someone, let's have a conversation now. Yes, yes. yeah. 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 Um, there is a specific timeline to that. So please reach out to me, whether it be after the call or this week, and we can talk through that. Uh, is it possible that if, let's say you're in your second year and um, you're running a lab that has all these graduate students doing different parts of the research and then all of them get sick, but they get sick at different times, right? One, one person has it, they're out for 14 days, then another one. And so that essentially slows down the ability of that lab to get to achieve its goals for that year. So that would be another instance or circumstance that we could take into account yep. um, from an extension of the tenure clock perspective. Yep. Okay. So what we can do is, I guess, prior to just opening this up and, you know, Melissa and I will hang out um, on the line to answer any questions if you want to ask them after this, uh, I wanted to share my screen one more time. And within this, I wanted to take you back to the main page. This is the wvu.faculty.edu. And if you click on faculty and leadership development, on this site, if you scroll down part way, it's gonna have the upcoming as well as past events. But then we also have recorded sessions here. And if you click on the view all recorded, let's hold on here. What you're gonna find is, and sometimes it takes a little bit to get these uh, uploaded after the recordings take place. But I would note that, let me just get down here. So we've got last year's PT for tenure track, and this will be replaced once this new one is completed. But as I had shared with you, we also have uh, Brian Meredith and whether it be the introduction to digital measures, as well as going up for promotion and tenure with digital measures, these are available for you to view. This is a great spot for you to go once again for whether it be recorded sessions or those that are upcoming. I, I think those uh, those from last year, Brian, or those this year's It usually takes at least two weeks from the time he gives a presentation to have them closed captioned and they have to be closed captioned to be loaded on the website. But we will send it, the, once we get the recorded session, we'll send it to everyone that signed up, even if they didn't attend. So they, they, they'll get that really, like within 48 hours, they, they'll get that really quickly. Yeah, those are, those are uh, last year's uh, sessions. I believe I had on a slightly different tie. Yes, those are last year's. Slightly different, not much. O different. Only slightly. Okay, so really for the tenure track faculty members and what we covered here today were the key documents, whether they be the ones you should have and or administrators should be uploading in digital measures. Um, we talked about the external evaluations. We talked about what does it look like for evidence and your narrative as it pertains to digital measures. 
and just again take into account um, what it looks like from a COVID pandemic perspective. So if anybody has any questions that they'd like to um, ask here and now, or we can stop the recording and just stay on and be open for any uh, questions that you may have.